Well, this video is about hemlock and toxic things in Stone of Farewell. Cheers! Welcome back everybody to me talking about books and today we will be talking about The Stone of Farewell, which is book two in the Memory Sorrow Thorn trilogy in four books by Tad Williams, which is the first part of his ongoing Austin Ard um, works. Um, <clears throat> and before we move further, yes, I'm aware of the fact that Navigator's Children has been pushed back to next year. I should have checked earlier. I'm bad at this. Um, yeah, well, well, we'll just go as far as we go and then I'll probably talk about Navigator's Children next year if there's still something left to say when it happens. Um, that's, um, yeah, I'm bad. I'm sorry. Also, I'm pissed off. Um, that it's not out yet. Anyway, um, let's actually go and talk about Stone of Farewell and we'll do the usual thing, which is I'll give you a quick synopsis. It'll be very short because, you know, this is book two in a series. You need to have read book one for it to make sense. Um, so there might be spoilers for that. And then I'll go into themes and stuff that is more spoilerish. So if you have not yet read Stone of Farewell, once I give the spoiler signal, there will be spoilers for the plot, the world, and so forth. Because, you know, these are 30-year-old books, but maybe you still want to read them. Uh, and you should. They're actually, you know, they're worthwhile reads, uh, no matter the negative things I'll have to say about them. So with that out of the way, let's get started. All right. So, The Stone of Farewell basically picks up where <clears throat> uh, the Dragonbone Chair finished uh, last time around and expands the story. Now, this is something we've seen before in other trilogies and other series where book two kind of expands on the stuff that happens in book one. So, we ended up with Simon um, attacking a, <laughs> a dragon, getting a magic sword, um, that's not his, um, and that's the end of that part. We also ended with the city of Naglimund, uh, of Joshua's, um, you know, stronghold at the time, um, being actually, you know, taken down by the Norns, um, the evil snow elves, so to speak, um, and, um, you know, Joshua and gang having to flee. We also know that uh, Prince Miramel went off to do things um, uh, to help her uncle and, you know, so we had a lot of seeds um, uh, that were planted for individual plot lines, which is exactly what happens in The Stone of Farewell, where we mostly focus these three um, main groups, those being um, obviously the Simon, um, uh, Simon uh, Binabic and gang a plot line that went to find uh, Thorn. We have the Joshua and associate people, uh, you know, refugees from What's the place called? Naglimund. And we have um, Princess Miriamel doing Princess Miriamel things um, together with other with Kadrak and other people. We also have an additional sort of um, plotline that was also planted, but kind of becomes more of one in uh, Stone of a Well, and that is in Hernisteria with um, Princess Megwin, who is the daughter of King Luth, Count Luth, King Luth, and um, is now in charge of the country. Um, these are all people that, you know, have to deal with um, different fallouts from, you know, the world becoming, you know, heading closer to um, the end of the world, because this is epic fantasy, and each of them has their own struggles, but it's a lot of traveling, it's a lot of going to different places, we see a much larger part of Ostenard in this one, and... Um, Everyone kind of ends up at the Stone of Farewell, um, where they all meet together and then ho hopefully have adventures into Green Angel Tower. That is um, basically the setup of this novel. Um, I'll not go into details before, beyond that. It's mostly a traveling book with um, the world getting worse around everyone and, yeah, sort of similar to what you get in, say, The Two Towers, where also everyone is rushing around and finding out how bad everyone stuff gets before we come to the big showdown in the third book. It's a trilogy, what you're expecting. So yeah, if you enjoy Dragonbone Chair, you should read on because mostly you get more of the same and it's if you enjoy the world, you should go and read this one as well. There are some issues that were not present in the first book that I'll talk about later in this one. Um, they're, yeah, I don't know. 
it's just a continuation um, uh, which feels a bit more sprawling than the first one, which is, you know, to be expected. So, I don't know, go read it, um, have fun with it, and now let's talk about themes and stuff, and there may be spoilers from here on out. The first spoiler is, I'll drink some beer. All right. So, uh, what do I have to talk about when it comes to Stone of Farewell? I want to continue some of the bits and pieces I talked about in the first video on the Dragonbone Chair and look more into the world-building side of things, the different cultures and species we meet during um, the second book, because, you know, the world is opened up far more to, for us. From the problems with those different cultures, we'll move on and talk about uh, the problems, or potentially problems, with female characters um, and characters in general. And then we move to character motivation, the problem of evil in epic fantasy, and then hopefully we'll be done. And I've listed all the things that I think are worthwhile to talk about here. Um, I'll also try to, you know, give praise where praise is um, warranted, because while I have a lot of critical thoughts here, these are still pretty good books. There's far worse shit out there, and you should definitely go and read them. They were definitely some of the best stuff happening at the time, and even, you know, today they hold up fairly well. So, with that out of the way, let's get going with culture wars stuff, I guess. See, when we talked about it last, um, I already mentioned that the depiction of the troll culture is somewhat um, problematic because it takes a lot of, you know, inspiration, influence from uh, Native American culture and especially um, the um, Inuit cultures and around that. Now, with the beginning of Stone of Farewell, we actually reach the troll homeland with Simon Jiriki, um, the... Um, Sithi Prince, and other folks showing up there. And while the culture, the, the Troll Kingdom is really cool, and Tad Williams does something here that I think works fairly well in general, which is, if you want to take a culture um, or inspiration from our world's cultures for your fantasy world building, mixing different cultures works really well to create something more nuanced or, well, new and different feeling. It's not just, you know, Elves in space, it's not just um, whatever culture you're imagining here. It's a bit of a mix of different things. And the trolls living in the high mountains are not just, well, they're still mostly influenced by um, and inspired by Native American culture, but there's also an added layer of Himalayan cultures, whether you want to talk about um, Tibet or Nepal or other places around that particular, you know, area, which means people living in very high mountains and having mountain climbing stuff going on and things like that. And there's cool bits here. The idea that the trolls are riding on, well, rams and goats, basically, is a really cool one. I, I do appreciate that. I do like that one. Unfortunately, when it comes to, um, you know, these inspirations, Tad Williams stays very surface. So the one big, hey, I found this from <laughs> Himalayan cultures bit is they're drinking tea with salt and butter in it, which is, I think, the, the one thing people in the 1980s knew about <laughs> or thought they knew about um, um, Himalayan cultures. And so obviously it ends up in here as well. And while it does show up in Terry Pratchett's Discworld, for example, it it's a joke there, and it's very clear that it's not necessarily, you know, the truth. Um, here, it's just played straight, and I don't know, man, it, it was an unnecessary detail, because while obviously cultures are made out of all these small and little details, putting one in this, you know, straight up from a different culture felt a bit out of place, and just shows that there is a lack of awareness um, when it comes to cultural appropriation and cultural influences, um, that, I think, is mostly a sign of the times back then. There's other bits and pieces in that whole episode about um, Binabek and Sludik being uh, the, the, the Rimmer's man, uh, the totally not a Viking guy, being prisoners and having to flee. And that, once again, I think is um, very much um, something that hopefully people would write differently today. Um, the idea that because of very specific traditions, um, they have to, you know, they're judged by the tribes and someone from the outside has to come and help. In this case, it's Simon who wants to interfere. And at the end of the day, um, through foresight and a bit of a sort of, um, 
I don't want to call it the deus ex machina, but it feels a bit lame, which is, you know, um, that um, Binabic's master had this scroll prepared and then suddenly everything is fine again. And Binabic and everyone gets gifts from the natives and they leave with now the natives recruited to um, uh, their um, own place, uh, to their own side. Um, the fact that, um, well, Binabic's um, betrothed, uh, Siski, is helping and planning the, these things because Simon is very much too um, um, much of a bumbling fool at the time to do anything about it himself. I think is a neat touch, but it's still very much the idea that um, these are noble savages and the civilized folks recognize the nobility and once everything has been cleared up, um, they are on their side and it just... It just feels a bit weird and wrong um, there that, you know, traditional... Um, well, traditions are sort of what keep the drama high and then when the outside world helps and understanding of progress from outside and obviously um, Okekuk, the uh, shaman, was a bit of, you know, he was a scroll bearer and one of those high and mighty educated people and civilized had contact with the civilized world. So he, he understands that tradition needs to be pushed aside. And I think that's... That's part of the problem there, is that outside forces decide that the um, uh, the traditional troll culture needs to move forward to face this new threat. It's not necessarily that the, the rest of the world needs to, uh, you know, come and meet the trolls halfway or whatever. It's the trolls have to um, move with the times. That is sort of implied. Once again, I've seen this handled far worse in other fantasy books. I'm just pointing out that I guess it's very much um, a cultural thing from the, you know, the 1980s, so it is there and it can certainly rub you the wrong way. Um, so much for the trolls. On the good side, we have people riding goats, which is awesome. I love that. Ram riders, totally on board. And, and Williams has a bunch of these really cool ideas from time to time. Where I'm like, wow, this is, this is awesome. I love this. These are the small bits and pieces that make a culture rememberable and uh, memorable and cool. So, we have that culture, but we have more cultures now, and there's uh, issues with those as well. Let's look at some of these. Um, there are, apparently, traveling people that are just mentioned. Um, now, you may question why Ostenard needs the Herc, uh, or whatever the name is, which seem to be Sinti, Romani, or whatever kind of traveling folks you have. If they're just name dropped and then never show up again, um, at least not in book uh, two. Um, but maybe maybe it's just one of these staples. You need to have traveling folks somewhere. Obviously we have, you know, the, the traveling uh, people in uh, Wheel of Time, and it's just like one of those staples that I think build this, like, generic fantasy idea that you have uh, with, um, you know, fantasy in the 1980s. It's like, yeah, this is pseudo-medieval Europe, and you have to have all these people in there. And I'm, I'm, I'm de deliberately avoiding uh, the uh, the G word here, because it's a, it's a bit of a bad one. Um, <clears throat> all right, so uh, what other cultures do we have? We have, of course, the Thrivings. Remember, Prince Joshua has a lover who becomes his wife during this book at some point, and she's from the Thrivings, who are... Your generic uh, Central Asian, Central Eastern European uh, nomads, I guess. That's sort of the culture. Yes, they do have wagons, but they're still like all about horses. They're fierce tribes, um, barbarians in that regard. At least they're not conquering the entire world and uh, showing how, you know, being in full armor is maybe not really that helpful if you have like a large cavalry and so forth. But they are, yes, Mongol, Han, um, Tartar, whatever nomad coded in a lot of ways. And once again, it, th this idea that you have civilized people, which are very much, um, you know, your um, Roman or Anglo-Saxon coded, which, you know, there there is something wrong if you think Anglo-Saxons are civilized, but, you know, and then you have the barbarians, which are Eastern coded or Native American coded. Um, it's... It's a sign of a very specific mindset, which sees, well, Western civilization as the pinnacle of civilization in a lot of cases. Um, and so the thriving situation with Joshua having to do, like, his duel there, because the uh, Vorsheva's father wants the bride price, all of that stuff is... It comes across as deliberately sort of crude, 
Um, now, obviously, we get the good barbarians, which decide to chip in with um, uh, with Josio, which is sort of this idea. It's like, yeah, so we need an antagonist. So we make the barbarians the antagonists, but we also make sure it's just because their boss is evil and everyone else is actually truly, you know, honorable, noble um, uh, savages. It's a trope. It's not a good trope. It's um, something that I found grating in particular because the idea of, you know, uh, Borsheba having to, uh, you know, having run away with Prince Joshua and so forth just because she doesn't want to marry the other guy. It, it feels a bit, um, yeah, very simplistic. And going back to staples of storytelling that you find more in adventure stories of the 1930s um, where the white outsider guy runs away with the uh, the native princess and so forth. And it's... There's reasons why we should no longer do that. And I think part of what makes this world, and this is why I'm bringing it up in detail, why, what makes this world work and accessible for a lot of people is that if you've grown up like me and a lot of other people of my age and probably above that age and maybe one generation below as well, if you've grown up with fantasy and adventure media and so forth, these things are part of our world view, subconscious worldview, or at least our expectations for fantasy books, which is why um, Austin art works so well, because it kind of just docks on to all of these bits and pieces of prejudice and uh, so forth. And I think that's partly what makes this book so, it feels so nostalgic to me. It's like, yeah, this is, this is all the stuff I still accepted as no problem when I was, I don't know, 12 or 14 or whatever. And, and, um, and it feels like coming home and being back in that childhood moment. And I think that's not the best way to go about things, but here we are. There is, of course, uh, the the swamp culture of the runner man. Um, we'll be talking about those in the next book because that's when we get way more Tiamak um, stuff. So I'll just let let it fly for now. There's some interesting things about racism and awareness as well of racism in that book. Um, but as I said, I'll keep it for the next one when we talk about Tiamak. So now let's talk about the Sithi. Now, we get to see more of the city this one time round. Simon gets to visit them in their city, city, which is not something I want to say again. Um, he meets Jiriki's um, uh, sister, um, whose name I have already forgotten because Etitu, something like that. Um, her main role seems to be um, uh, to wear as little clothes as possible. Um, we'll go to that point as well. So the city culture seems to be inspired by a very specific form of Orientalism um, that creates a weird image of both Japan and China, kind of conflates those, and this, this form of um, Orientalism. It's like their city is, um, you know, very aerial. You have all these walls that you can basically walk through because they're of cloth and stuff. You also have peacocks wandering around. There's a lot of Orientalist imagery in, in there. There's obviously other stuff mixed with that, but that's sort of this Eastern mysticism. They're all, you know, doing weird rituals, um, the dancing of the years, and they're all very, you know, contemplative, and time has a different meaning. So what happens here, and I think this is something that we see a lot with uh, Ted Williams, we'll come back to that, is that going with something like Middle Earth and Tolkien, which is obviously a huge influence here, he then tries to give it a more um, down-to-earth feel by adding more of our world's cultures, whereas Tolkien's Middle Earth is only white folks from England, mostly. <laughs> and and this is why he ends up with like elves, or in this case, the city being sort of immortal and long-lived. Um, and Ted Williams casts around, it's like, what kind of cultures from our world can we take that have a different feel for time and so forth? And he's like, well, I know it. It's over there in the East. Um, and that once again, it's it's a bit problematic when you have especially um, uh, the description of the um, city women dressing in transparent stuff, which is a stereotype about a lot of East Asian women that um, has led to a lot of problems. Once again, I don't think this is done on purpose and with like any malign back thoughts, but it, once again, it's the 1980s. There's a lot of influence from 1930s adventure stories in here, and if you want to see um, Asian women objectified, go read some 1930s pulp novels. It's bad. Um, there's some cool bits here as well. I really appreciate um, the idea of the city having this long tapestry, woven tapestry, that 
kind of shows in images the history of the city and when they come from the garden country over to um, Ostenard, the, the story kind of, the, the tapestry kind of, the weaving hanging crosses over a river. That's a really cool detail. And once again, this is one of the strengths of Tad Williams. It's like coming up with really cool specific details and bits and pieces and putting them in. And that's why while these cultures are very heavily influenced from real world by real world cultures, they do have unique bits and pieces in there. Maybe I'm a bit less angry at the city because I know far less about East Asian culture than I know about, um, well, I don't know much about native culture as well, but it, it felt more obvious with the trolls. And also the city are obviously portrayed as a more uh, aloof race in a more positive light, but, you know, there's positive stereotypes as well, and they are still stereotypes and problematic. So that's what we get with the city, which brings us once again to the objectification of women and Aditu, or whatever her name is, um, Yiriki's sister. Because we have here a very interesting thing, which is what I would call the double temptation um, plot line. It's something you see in the eye of the world as well, where our lover pair of um, Randall Thor and um, Egwene uh, uh, during Eye of the World gets split up and each of them meets um, someone of the opposite sex and there's a bit of temptation because we kind of know they're going together or something. And in this book, it's obviously Simon and Miriamel. And we'll get to Miriamel later. So Simon has to overcome the temptation of getting horny when he sees um, Jiriki's sister run around almost naked and in transparent clothes. Um, yeah, it's it's not it's not necessarily it's not good is my point. Um, you don't have to make a point of explaining that women in this culture wear basically nothing, um, whereas the guys at least well there's some shirtless um, male city as well. So there's that. Um, <clears throat> It's just unnecessary, and I think that temptation plotline is a bad one, because once again, you have a male protagonist, and you have a female protagonist, and you have each of them, um, you know, overcoming the temptation, or not overcoming the temptation, as the case may be, um, to test their love for each other, because you know they'll end up together near the end of the overall story. Well, um, hats off to um, Robert Jordan, who makes a goes down a different path. Um, that's really good. I like that. I do very much appreciate that um, <clears throat> about, you know, Rand not ending up with Egwene. There's other problems with Wheel of Time, but we're not going down that route today. My point here is, however, that, well, Simon does manage to overcome it, mostly by being really awkward and uh, not knowing what to do um, with uh, women, uh, whereas Princess Miriamel encounters uh, Count as Earl Spites, um, one henchman of um, priorities and so forth, and she ends up in bed with him. And there's a lot of bad things to be said. Even back when I read it for the first time, that, that plot line left a really bad taste in my mouth. She is very selfish and we'll get to that point, and then she decides to kind of give in to Earl Spites. He very much forces herself himself on his... There, there's a lot of problems with, you know, him using his power level, his, um, the power imbalance there. He's got her on his ship and he basically... Consent is not necessarily an option in this thing, but Ted Williams does try to make it clear that there's also sort of, you know, Miriam L trying to, you know, get, gain agency by, you know, going for it at the beginning. It's... It's very awkward because while sexuality does finally enter the fantasy world in the 1980s, <laughs> Ted Williams is not necessarily good at writing healthy sexuality. Most fantasy authors are really bad. Most male fantasy authors are incredibly bad at writing healthy sexuality up to this point. Um, but it's, it, it kind of shows there. And the idea that the male protagonist is much more stalwart when it comes to avoiding temptation, whereas the female protagonist is much more open to flirt, does in fact, you know, reinforce for stereotypes about female, well, about women in a lot of ways, in sexist stereotypes about women being much more open to flirt with, you know, all kinds of guys. It, it, it's a it's a road you don't want to go down. But unfortunately, um, Ted Williams does sort of go down that route. It would have been interesting to see the other way around and, you know, Simon um, falling for a woman or whatever, but that's not what we get. Which brings us to the female characters and the what someone um, recently called angry woman syndrome. See, we have a bunch of female characters. It's the 1980s, you've got to have female characters. We have reached the second wave of feminism. Even male authors have realized there are women in the world. And you can't just have them, you know, draped around uh, Conan's legs anymore. 
The problem is, how do you write these women? How do you write strong female characters? And that's something people are, uh, male writers are still learning in the 1980s, which is pretty horrifying. <laughs> that's what we have. And what Ted Williams goes for is very similar to what you see with Robert Jordan, but because Ted Williams is a far better writer, he manages to make it less egregious or less obviously egregious. So we have Borsheba as a female character who is constantly very emotional and angry because Joshua doesn't give her all, you know, the attention that she wants. She's supposed to be a strong character, right? She went after him. She's obviously a chieftain's daughter. She's very capable in all kinds of ways, but she, she's overly emotional and has to um, get her will and gets angry at Joshua and then, you know, sulks and that makes everyone else unhappy. It's, it's unfortunate that basically being angry at Joshua is the only emotion she gets to show. Being willful and angry is the only emotion she gets to show, whereas, you know, well, Joshua's pretty much the dickhead in that relationship for a large part of it. <laughs> and, and, and while she kind of brings that up, because of the way it is framed and of her being emotional and him being very rational, it, it doesn't really work that well. And we have other female characters which are going down a similar path. You have Megwin um, of the Hernestiri, who constantly uh, talks about how she's, well, not very good looking because she's way too large and too strong and too, well, not feminine enough. And that makes her do all kinds of irrational things and be a bit of a dick to her love interest, um, uh, the, the Count of Matmulach. I f keep forgetting his name. It doesn't really matter. So she's being irrationally angry and pushing the boy around, the guy around, because she lacks self-confidence and, once again, is willful and emotional and... Yeah, it, once again, it seems to be that women, now that they have emotions, they only get the emotion of angry, and which is which is not good. And it still kind of sexualizes them because once again, it's still about how good looking they are and how how what they really want is a healthy working relationship with their one partner. They don't get to you know be independent, and do whatever they want. Th what they want at the end of the day is being a monog in a monogamous heterosexual relationship. Which brings us to Princess Mariamel. She wants to have agency, she wants to help the world uh, for all kinds of reasons. There's some nuanced backstory with, you know, the lack of love she gets from her father and so forth. But her reaction is, once again, to do willful things, um, to get really angry whenever something happens. Like, she does not understand um, the things that are happening. And the problem is, because we as the reader get all the framework, we realize that her being willful there and being angry is ridiculous. These people are trying to help her, but she gets still really angry. And her only reaction is, once again, anger and being headstrong and ignoring good advice. And um, all of that, you know, reinforces is that idea that women, while they may now be loud and angry, which is, you know, the result of, like, mostly second-wave feminism, for male writers, I guess, while they may be, you know, out there and loud and so forth, but they, what they really need is still men helping them out because their forwardness will definitely lead them into trouble and then men need to help them. And, yeah, that's, that's a bad pattern. I mean, I feel like one of the results of that form of feminism in the 80s was this idea that men and women both are unique in their own ways and have like a reinforced that gender bina uh, binary with like really bad stereotypes. It's the whole like, you know, why uh, man can't do this or women can't do this uh, kind of books. The men are from Mars, women are from Venus books, which were really popular in the late 80s and early 90s. And you see that happening here and it just doesn't work too well because it lacks motivation for a lot of characters. It's just like, well, women be angry and not understanding men, and men be sad because women be angry. And we've moved beyond that. And the interesting thing is that unlike, say, 1930s um, uh, and 1950s fantasy like Tolkien or even Howard um, or whatever, um, there are people who get motivations, which brings us to the problem of evil in fantasy. See, in Middle-earth, there is no such thing as complex motivations for evil. Evil is evil because evil wants to rule the world and wants to dominate everything. Which works for Sauron, which works for Melkor, because their patent of, say, Paradise Lost and the, the image of Satan in Paradise Lost in a lot of ways. However, this is the 1980s. Characters need motivation. So our bad guys, both King Elias and, obviously, um, 
the Storm King in Loki need complex motivations. So in Loki wants revenge for the humans pushing him out of his place and taking the land away from the city, which is interesting when you you could read them, you know, as natives being pushed out by colonizers. He could use that framing, and he now wants to use, you know, destroy the entire world because he's angry at everyone. And yeah, that's a, that's a motivation. It's more than you know, Sauron just wanting to rule the world. I'm not sure it's, if it's a much better motivation, but at least there is that idea of making it about something less metaphysical than just, you know, that guy's evil. Capital E, evil. Unless, and this is where things kind of break down again, is um, when it comes to uh, human emotions and um, signposting them. Elias is sort of like someone we are supposed to pity in a way, because obviously he's he's a tormented person, and which is why he falls for priorities, doing all these things because he's capital E evil. But he's also comic book villain, capital E evil. I didn't talk about it, but it, the first scene we kind of really see him in detail is when he just casually kills a dog. It just kicks a dog to death. And I'm like, a puppy, a young dog. It's like, yeah, I get it. He's evil. <laughs> he just does that because he wants to be evil. And, and that's something that kind of happens again and again here is the way that physical appearance and actions signal um, morals in, an, in a lot of ways. You see it with Priorities, of course, but you also see it in another character that I find really, like, really disturbing in this time reading it, which is Scotty, the Mad Witch. Because Scotty obviously seems to be... Um, there, there's a, the attempt... And I think this is the interesting bit here. There's the attempt of making her, you know, she obviously has magical powers, her parents have pushed her out for that, so she has all kinds of mental health issues, um, becomes uh, evil and struggling. Well, not to put a fine word on it, she's basically what fantasy would call mad. And that's why she serves the dark powers now. And how do we learn about that? Well, she's incredibly obese. We get, we get like, the entire interactions with her, it's mentioned in every description how grossly overweight she is. And that's body shaming. That's really bad body shaming. And signposting that someone is evil by showing them as overweight and physically beyond, you know, regular beauty standards is something that we see in a lot of, you know, 70s, 80s, even before that kind of way, it's something <laughs> that um, Robert Jordan, once again, seems to be sort of aware when he makes the jokes that, like, you know, only fat innkeepers are nice and thin innkeepers are really evil. It kind of goes down that route, but it's it's highly problematic when you have a female character and you want to signpost her as evil if all you do is like, well, she seems to be a bit, you know, different mentally, and also she's really fat. It's like, don't do that. It's it's bad writing in that regard, and it reinforces all kinds of stereotypes. The sad part, however, once again, is that, yeah, that makes it very accessible, because we've grown up in a media landscape that has used people not looking, you know, conforming to beauty standards as, you know, a shorthand to show them as evil for a long time. So we kind of fall for it, and make it which makes this, once again, so angry, uh, makes me so angry about it, because it's... it's it's so seductive. It's so easy to just read through it. It's like, oh, oh, I guess she's she's going to be evil. And while there is some, you know, sort of spooky atmosphere around the entire scene, it it kind of gets cheapened by by these these elements. I think, at least for me. And I think that's that's sort of where I want to end this um, second part of talking about memories around Thorn. Because while Ted Williams is definitely modernizing and bringing new ideas to the epic fantasy genre, um, the trouble with that is, is making it more of this world and less of the other world of the mythic, of the ethereal, of the metaphysical in, that you find with Tolkien. The problem is, if you go to our world and not just deal in abstracts uh, as Tolkien does, you're taking up all the bad bits of our world, because our world is full of stereotypes, our world is full of racism, of sexism, of all kinds of other prejudices and marginalization. And if you're not aware, it's very easy to just take in all the bad bits when you make a story more of this world than of some magical other world. Making it that comes with dangers. And the problem is that in the 1980s, we were 
still pretty bad at recognizing these things because, you know, white hegemony was way more of a thing, and white male hegemony was way more of a thing than it is today. So most people just ignored this, which once again is the point here. I'm not calling Tad Williams an evil person in any sense. I'm, I think it's just stuff that has aged badly because we've luckily moved further away from these general cultural mindsets. Which makes this a bit of a mixed bag because, as I said, you start doing good things by giving characters motivations and so forth. You would bring in the bad things because some of these motivations will be sort of rooted and inspired by sexism, by misogyny, by racism, and so forth. And that's that's the bad parts. But we can talk about it, and hopefully, with the new books, I'm still holding out hope for those, uh, things have changed and become more um, diverse and more aware, which would be really good. And that brings us to the hemlock. Yes, I did not forget the bit from the beginning. And I want to make a point here. See, when I read this book, um, I was wondering why every plant is hemlock. Now, I know hemlock as the thing we use uh, to get rid of annoying philosophers, which is a plant of the carrot family, apparently, with big flowers that you use to mix this drink and then people die. It's, well, highly toxic. However, <laughs> throughout Stone of Farewell, everything is hemlock all the time. And at some point, Simon eats a lot of plants and he's like, well, so far he's not dying. Um, someone told him to eat plants. And I'm like, if everything is hemlock, he should be dead by now. And then... I double-checked, and it turns out there's also a tree called hemlock. It's a coniferous tree, and it grows in North America. You can make furniture out of it. It is also called hemlock, because apparently the needles smell similar to hemlock. Um, but it's not poisonous. <laughs> and now I found out that there's two hemlocks, and while all of Austin Ord is full of hemlocks, it's the other kind. My point here is that um, it helps to double-check our assumptions. See, I make assumptions all the time. I'm often right because I have a fairly solid education for a guy in the Western world. Um, but even I can be wrong. On the other hand, I assume Ted Williams, being American, when he hears the word hemlock, he's like, oh, it's those trees out there. <laughs> and um, that is something I want to encourage all of you to do is, you know, when something is weird and feels off, I don't know, double check, do some research if you're maybe getting it wrong because your education or, you know, the place in the world that you are is so different from the place of the author that you might just misunderstand something. Because at the end of the day, very few authors are assholes uh, on purpose or do something wrong on purpose or make mistakes on purpose. I'm, I'm sure there are some, but most are not. Ted Williams certainly is not. And I thought this Hemlock example might be a bit funny, but also show that deeper um, issue that I try to be aware of um, but often, obviously, also fail from time to time. And that brings us to our final thoughts. Stone of Farewell expands the world of Austin Art compared to Dragonbone Chair. It does so mostly well. The different plots and the different characters are all, you know, interesting enough to not make the reader, or me at least, sit down and go like, well, I wish we were back with Annoying Simon, um, or, you know, any of the others. They're all interesting, even, you know, TMX's story becomes more and more interesting throughout the story, the whole book, and, uh, yeah. It all is a solid book, the second book for a large epic trilogy, which is not always easy to do. So, respect for that um, to, uh, well, Tad Williams. And there are obviously issues which are largely rooted in the idea of taking a genre, modernizing it, um, and still being very much tied to the time and place of, a, of an author, in this case, America of the late 1980s, which is a place very different. Well, it's 30 years, but throughout the last 30 years, things have changed massively. And I think it helps us to be aware of that, point out the critical problems there, um, the issues, and, well give the author some grace um, to see where things are going now that he has written new books. And that's where I want to leave this. I had fun reading it. I got annoyed, especially around the whole Miriam L thing. I'll be coming back to that when we talk about the next book. But beyond this, this is not a bad book by any stretch of the imagination. It's up there as one of the better epic fantasy books of the 1980s, 1990s. It's certainly far better than, you know, what Terry Goodkind or Robert Jordan were producing at the same time, by a long shot. And that's what I want to leave you with. So, have you read Stone of Farewell? 
Did you like it? Did you hate it? Did you find different things to hate than I found? Did you find different things to like than I found? Um, let me know in the comments. Um, I'll be back talking about To Green Angel Tower Part 1 sometime next week. I'm already half through the book by now, so it shouldn't take too long. And uh, yeah, thanks for sticking with me so long. Um, I'll see you in the next one, and uh, cheers.